Now today, we have a very special program that I have personally been greatly looking forward to, and we have three best-selling political humorists. Andrew Schaefer here is the New York Times best-selling author of Hope Never Dies, an Obama-Biden mystery. The international, yes. The international best-selling uh, best parody, 50 Shames of Earl Grey, and numerous other humorous works of fiction and nonfiction. He is a two-time Goodreads Choice Award nominee and a finalist in the humor category, and his new book is Hope Rides Again on Obama Biden Mystery. Please welcome Andrew Schaefer. Okay. We also have with us, uh, and, and I should say one of the best sellers uh, at uh, the Midtown Scholar uh, over the past months uh, have been those, uh, that series. Yeah, Ian Desher is the New York Times bestselling author of William Shakespeare's Star Wars. Do you know that series? It's incredible. Um, and the Pop Shakespeare series. He has a BA in uh, music from Yale University, was there just after I was, and a Master of Divinity uh, from Yale Divinity School, as well as a PhD from the Union Theological Seminary. We have to ask how that informs your humor. We will. <laughs> uh, his new book is entitled Mac Trump, a Shakespearean tragic comedy of the Trump administration, part one. <laughs> and he lives in Portland, Oregon with uh, his family. So please welcome Ian. <laughs> Finally, we have Jacopo della Kershia, uh, which is the pseudonym. It is a, a well-chosen pseudonym for a former Obama staffer. And he uh, is the author of, uh, among other things, The Great Abraham Lincoln Pocket Watch Conspiracy and License to Quill. <laughs> A scholar with the New York Council for the Humanities and a history writer who has offered more than 100 articles for the comedy website Cracked.com. And he is the co-author, along with Ian, of Mac Trump, a Shakespearean tragic comedy of the Trump administration, part one. Please welcome Jacopo. So a special thank you to all of our authors and our format today is we're going to let each of them talk a little bit about their books individually and then uh, they'll have a bit of a conversation amongst themselves and then we're going to open it up for questions. So um, uh, uh, please, a uh, warm Harrisburg welcome to all of our authors and then we will begin with Andrew. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for having me here in Midtown and Harrisburg. I didn't know I was going to be on the stage with, a, with an actual scholar, right? Yes. A Yale? A, a, a Yale guy? A Yaley. A Yaley? Is that what that is? That is yeah. uh, another, another Yale uh, uh, scholar history? I, I didn't know. I'm just a Big Ten guy, so I'm <laughs> sorry. I'm, fr I'm from Iowa, um, not Penn State, but... <laughs> uh, so, so, so forgive me if, uh, you know, I, I, I just don't have the learned smarts of some of these other guys, but um, I, do have, I do have an apology to make first off, uh, which is, uh, I, I, I hesitate to bring this up, but I, I have to say it, about th three years ago I published a book. It was called Day of the Donald, Trump Trumps America. And I published it before Donald Trump became president. It was a satire about a world in which Donald Trump becomes president. <laughs> and I intended it to be this lighthearted, humorous book about all these crazy, at the time Donald Trump was, was polling at like 1% uh, that I wrote it and I was like, this will never happen and this publisher's like, yeah, we gotta get this book out right away because you know, no one's gonna believe it, it's gonna be hilarious though, it's gonna be a great satire, it's gonna be so much, because that's what people say about satires, right? It's gonna be so much fun, you know? Um, I didn't realize that the reason that George Orwell wrote 1984 instead of 1948 was because you don't want to be around long enough for your satire to become true <laughs> or for it to be proven false. Uh, either way is not good. So I, I wrote this book. It came out the week that uh, week before Donald Trump was set to do the whole the Democratic, the Republican National Convention. 
And everyone was like, don't worry, Paul Ryan will save us. He's going he's gonna to do something. Um, that didn't happen either, but my book completely flopped. It was horrible. I mean, even amongst my friends, none of my liberal friends wanted to read it because they were like, is this going to jinx the election? And none of my conservative friends wanted to read it because there weren't any pictures. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's, that's a joke. I, I don't have any conservative friends. <laughs> now, when Trump was elected, I realized, um, first off, that I was a witch and that I needed to use my power in the future for good, not evil. Um, so from that point on, I said, I'm only going to do good things with this, with this immense power that I have accumulated um, to sell many hundreds of books. <laughs> I think the books only sold like 800 copies. Um, you, you definitely, you don't have copies of this here, do you? You've never heard of it, right? No, no. <laughs> we pulped them all. It was the first book burning that was authorized and promoted by the author. Because I was like, we need to get rid of this in some sort of ritual. So I, I, wrote, I, I wrote a book. Uh, I decided to do a book about Obama and Biden as amateur sleuths. Now, I got this idea about a week or two after they were out of office. All of a sudden, there was this wave of Obama and Biden nostalgia that swept the country. Nobody knew exactly what we had in them, the best friend duo, what we had until it was too late. And then we were all like, don't go, don't leave us, you know, don't leave us at grandma's house. She's, oh, and they just drove off. Now, you know what happened, right, was, was, was uh, Obama was going around the world on his vacation to end all vacations. Do you remember this? He was jet skiing with, uh, with uh, the guy that owns Virgin. What's his name? Uh-huh. Richard Branson. Richard Branson. He was uh, hang gliding with uh, Bradley Cooper or whatever. He was, he was hanging out with every rich guy on the planet besides Jeffrey Epstein. He was going crazy. <laughs> and people said, what about Michelle? Where's Michelle and the kids? And I said, no, forget Michelle. Where's Joe? Where's Joe at? You know, because they were best friends. They were best friends for eight years. They had lunch together once a week. I, you know, I don't, uh, I'm 40, so I don't have a best friend, um, but I am married. And, you know, we do have lunch once a week. And, I, you know, that would be weird if she just went on a vacation with all these guys. And that would actually be a lot of problems with that. Um, but, yeah, I was just thinking about what happened to Joe. He's just sitting at home, nothing to do, sitting on the computer. And then I said, well, what about if... All of a sudden, in the backyard, he sees a little flicker of light, and then he smells the Marlboro Red come through the window. He says, oh, what is that? That couldn't be. That couldn't be. It's probably a prowler. So he tells Jill, I'm going to go take Champ out. He takes Champ outside, and Champ runs right off to a stranger in the yard. And he says, I don't want to get my hopes up, because hope is just a four-letter word. And... He goes over there, he's, he's all prepared. This, is, this could be a prowler or something. It turns out that it's Barack Obama. He's standing there smoking a cigarette and he says, Joe, we need to talk. And that was the image that came to me. And then I said, I don't know what's gonna happen next. I didn't know then that I was writing a mystery book or actually a full series, because it's at two books right now. Um, I didn't know I was doing that. I just knew I was writing a book about two, you know, best friends and their estrangement and then how they came back together. And it's really, there's a lot of emotions. And so when I started to write, I was like, I was like, they can't just talk for 300 pages. I need like a dead body or something, right? And so that's how it became a mystery. And when I turned it into my publisher, uh, my publisher said that, I said, you know, there's going to be some emotional stuff in there. I apologize. I, we can take it out if you don't think it's funny. And he said, no, it's not funny. But people around here were crying. And that was like the first time I've ever made someone cry reading one of my books, you know, unintentionally, you know. And, and I was like, wow, that's, a, that's, that's amazing. It was um, just, there's just this nostalgia that people had for the two, but then also a nostalgia for a world in which two people who were very different, because when they started off, Obama and Biden did not like each other. It was just a, a political marriage. And then over the years, it became something much deeper. Um, 
it's like in a romance with an arranged marriage, you know, where, or like a bromance. I say, oftentimes I compare the book to uh, Lethal Weapon, which is one of the, my favorite romance uh, films. Um, you know, they, they're not supposed to be together, but over time they, be, they see, you know, in one another, right? You, you've seen Lethal Weapon. Lethal Weapon 2, Lethal Weapon 3, Lethal Weapon... Well, you know, yeah, so you threw Joe, Joe Pesci into the mix. I don't consider those true canon. But anyway, um, you know, once Joe Biden, though, came back this year, I didn't think he was going to come back onto the political stage. I thought he was done. Um, a lot of people thought he was done. And I have to say, it hasn't been as much fun as I'd hoped because He's been pretty serious. Every time he gets up on stage, he's got, he's, he's got a serious face on his like, he's like, this is the worst administration since whatever the hell was before Obama, and we need to do something about this, and uh, no time to joke around. And I'm like, no, we want, we want you to joke around. We want you to make us feel good again. Um, but it hasn't happened, and that's kind of the one thing that I've kind of come to see is that, you know, the Joe, and uh, I'll watch him sometimes, and be like, oh, the Joe in my book would never do that. <laughs> Uh, the Joe in my book has definitely evolved on busing. You know, it's just these little things that the Joe in my book does a little differently. And, uh, you know, I said, I said they're welcome even to take anything they want from my book, the, the campaign. If they want to take the titles, you know, for their new slogan, Hope Never Dies or Hope Rides Again, they can do that. That's fine. I won't charge them very much. A little friend discount. But I did have this idea that I wanted to do uh, that I think... Joe Biden needs to do is do some, some more jokes, specifically jokes about his age, because everybody can see you're, you're, you know, you're older than, you know, dirt, and, um, and we need to, you need to bring, you need to talk about that. Instead, he just kind of ignores it, you know, and says, yeah, I don't pass the torch, I'll pass you the torch, buddy. And no, he needs to talk about this. He needs to get it out in the open. And so I wrote him some jokes. So if, if we have a moment, would you like to hear a couple of these jokes for Joe? This is for Joe to say. So uh, it goes, Joe Biden is so old. He knew the Golden Girls when they were just girls. <laughs> Joe Biden is so old. How old is he? He still uses two spaces after a period. <laughs> and I know a few of you are like, when did that change? <laughs> right? I don't know if there are any Hamilton fans here. I know we got one up there. Hamilton fans? So, uh, if you haven't seen Hamilton, how many of you have seen Hamilton the musical? Um, I just saw it in Kentucky a while back. I live in Kentucky now. Um, I'm not going to say anything about Mitch McConnell. Um, but uh, I saw it a couple of months ago. I was just, I, for years I had been trying to avoid, avoid it because people who talk about it, they talk about it like converts, like someone who talks about CrossFit within the first 90 days. They're like, oh my God, you got to try this. You got to try this. It's so good. Or someone who does like crack for the first time. I'm like, no, I think you should wait at least a year before you start evangelizing whatever your, your, your new enthusiastic thing is. And that was what I felt about Hamilton as well. The, the weird thing was though, is that I, I, I didn't want to pay money to it. I won some of those tickets from one of those Hamilton lotteries. It's the only lottery I've ever entered in my life. And I won these tickets and they were like in the front row and everybody in the whole place is looking down at me and I'm just like, oh, this is so exciting. I can't believe I'm here. And it was so moving, mostly because I did not know what was going to happen. <laughs> I knew that he got shot, right? Sorry if this is a spoiler for anyone, but I knew that Hamilton got shot by uh, this uh, Bill Burr, or whatever his name was. I knew he got shot by this guy. I did not know, I did not know that he was not president. I thought that, my wife was a big Hamilton fan, like way back in high school, she wrote a love letter to Hamilton. She was like an original Hamilton stan, and so, that whole time, she would just say he was the sexiest founding father, which is the grossest sentence in the English, English language. 
And so I just didn't want to know anything about this guy. I was like, if I see that guy, we're going to have words. <laughs> and so what happened was I didn't know anything about him. I never wanted to know anything about him. I didn't realize that he wasn't president. So at the end of this Hamilton, he gets shot and he's gets down, he's not getting up, and I'm like, no, you have to get up because you're going to be president soon, right? You're gonna, you still got to be, he didn't get up, and I started to cry, and I had the most emotional, uh, so actually just, if you go see it, forget everything I just told you, because uh, it's so great, just go into it not knowing anything. I've ruined that for you now, but I apologize. Just a couple more here. Joe Biden is so old. How old is he? When he was senator, he took the train to D.C. every day for 36 years because he didn't know cars had been invented. <laughs> you can boo if you want. These are for Joe, not me. I would never say stuff like this. And then one final one here before I turn the mic over. Joe Biden is so old. How old is he? He helped liberate the airports during the Revolutionary War. <laughs> And what a segue to the Trump administration. Um, I'm just not going to be as funny as Andrew. Uh, it's just impossible, because he's just too funny. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about how McTrump came to be. Uh, and uh, then I'm going to pass it over to Giacomo um, to uh, say a little more about that. Um, but. Fifteen months ago, I read a book called License to Quill, which, as you heard, was the first book by Jacopo della Quercia, otherwise known as Giacomo Calabria. Um, and I, being the kind of person I am, looked him up online and sent him an email and was like, hey, I really liked your, your book. Because what it is is it's basically Shakespeare as James Bond. Um, and uh, you know, I was like, I'm a guy who's done some Shakespeare mashup kind of stuff, and, uh, and I really enjoyed this. And he had heard of my books, and he wrote me back and said, uh, hey, I, I know who you are, too, um, and maybe we should work on something together. Um, and he sent me a few different ideas. And one of the ideas that he sent me was, what if we wrote a Shakespearean play about the Trump administration? And that was interesting to me, because in, during the 2016 election, uh, I had, it was around August or September before the election, and I was getting really nervous and was starting to think, is there something I could do in my little corner of the world to maybe help at all boost the cause of Hillary Clinton? And I thought, maybe I'll write a, a Shakespearean play about the sort of succession of Barack Obama uh, with Trump and Clinton as, as characters and that sort of thing. And I didn't do it, and that's probably why she lost, and I'm sorry. Um, uh, and so. I had had this idea also to sort of feature Trump in a, in a Shakespearean play. And so I said, well, let's, let's talk about that. And we ended up uh, putting the story together uh, before we'd ever met each other, uh, and uh, because I live in Oregon and he lives in New York. And we put the story together, pitched it, pitched it to Quirk Books, which is, uh, which is all of our publisher, actually, uh, for these latest books, uh, and had been my publisher of my previous books also. and uh, and. They liked it, and we wrote the whole thing in a uh, crashing five and a half weeks um, back in February and March, um, going back and forth on Google Docs. Again, never met each other until uh, this past May after the manuscript was written and turned in. Um, but I want to give you a couple of pieces of the book. Uh, the opening chorus is a sonnet, as many of my opening chorus moments are from my books. And this is how it goes. One nation under God divides in twain, half to the right their power on the rise, half to the left in fury and disdain, two peoples held by aging, fragile ties. Is this America, which once so proud above the height of lesser nations stood? How hath there come this overwhelming cloud to darken freedom's light so pure and good? A la election like an axe assaults a stump hath torn the country easily in two, and from the wreckage riseth one McTrump, whose government begins with much ado. If thou hast humor, hear our history, which may prove comedy or tragedy. So there's the opening course. I, I should also mention, I haven't, we haven't mentioned this, and we've been doing book events the last uh, week or so because uh, the book just came out on Tuesday. Um, and I haven't mentioned this before, uh, but because Andrew's here, and I don't think Andrew probably knows this at all either, there is a scene, uh, this is act three, scene six, where uh, McTrump is visited by the ghosts of former presidents Obama, uh, as well as George the Lesser and George the Greater and Richard the Worst and others. Um, but uh, 
McTrump basically asks Obama, uh, how are you hither come to wreak your, wait, why do you have a ghost? You're still alive. And Obama replies, because hope never dies, uh, which was a, a reference to Andrew's book. Uh, yes. So that's all I'm going to say for now, uh, and we're going to pass it over to my co-author. Thank you very Thank much. You. How do you do? I'm Joe Biden. I'm so old, George Washington said he wants his false teeth back. <laughs> You're a genius, man. That was so funny. If he just does, if he just makes fun of his age for the next 13 months, he's going to be the next president of the United States. Uh, thank you so much. Um, first of all, I want to apologize. Um, if any of you are here to see Jacopo de la Quercia, he's dead. He's been dead for 400 years. Uh, just a brief introduction. My name is Giacomo, not Jacopo. Uh, essentially, um, I did work in the 2008 uh, presidential election. I was a field organizer and then a staffer for then Senator Obama during his campaign. I actually worked here in Pennsylvania. And uh, ultimately, when I started doing writing, which really, um, in terms of my background, my background was mainly history, Niccolo Machiavelli, the Italian Renaissance. And I always viewed Machiavelli as being sort of this link holding history and politics together. That when I started doing some of that writing in comedy, a friend of mine who was much wiser on these subjects, uh, he was in um, Washington, he said, you need a pen name. So I chose the name Jacopo de la Quercia because Jacopo de la Quercia was actually a Sienese artist. And a little bit how Mark Twain meant something very near and dear to Samuel Clemens. Mark Twain is actually the, it's actually the part of the river where safe waters become dangerous, but also it can mean when dangerous waters become safe, sort of edgy. It's uh, something that was like a little bit of an Easter egg for Sam Clemens, who worked on the Mississippi, as you know. So just as that meant something very near and dear to Sam Clemens, Jacobo de la Quercia means something very near and dear to me, which is history or a surprise history lesson. So I bet you weren't expecting that. OK, so as for McTrump, which um, again, this was just uh, my first co-authorship, a remarkable experience. I was a huge fan of Ian's William Shakespeare Star Wars series. And uh, it is remarkable. We wrote this entire book before we had even met each other. We did it all online. We were able to do this on Google Books. It really just started as a skeleton that we were building the story upon. We started off with a cast of characters, which is really just the simplest way of marrying these two subjects, marrying contemporary politics with um, the works of William Shakespeare. And so we were just thinking, well, Trump sounds a little bit like Macduff, so maybe Trump, Mac Trump, we could be doing that. And uh, there is one interesting thing. I just want to say, um, you are actually not a witch. You're a scientist. And I know that today, science is considered witchcraft by this administration, so it's easily mistakable. But no, I say that because if you have a pretty good understanding of political science, you can probably figure out that one thing that really helps in politics is name recognition. And in the 2016 Republican primaries, you had about 20 white guys on stage who pretty much all had the same position, and you had one person who had his own reality show and was universally known around the entire country. I think it was quite clear he was going to win the nomination just on that regard alone. And from a Shakespearean point of view, I actually, the first satire I ever did involving Trump, I don't even think I told you this, Ian, was I was discussing the uh, Republican primaries at the Mark, at uh, where we were in Connecticut, the University of St. Joseph. And I was saying that Trump, in Shakespearean terms, he's almost like a bizarro version of Julius Caesar, where Julius Caesar built Hadrian's Wall. We're going to build a wall from one side of England to the other, and the barbarians are going to pay for it. And there's nothing wrong with barbarians. I love barbarians. My hair used to belong to a barbarian. <laughs> that uh, ultimately, using that the whole same idea of going back and forth with these Shakespearean predecessors, essentially Trump is uh, Mac Trump. Uh, we have Lady Mac Trump, Dame Destavanka, Donison and Erickson, which Ian deserves full credit for. Uh, we have his messenger, McTweet, who <laughs> plays an interesting role in the story, which I will very quickly read in Act One, Scene One, in the streets of Washington. 
And just very quickly to mention, Shakespeare always has someone that is supernatural in some regard in his plays. He has witches throwing ingredients into a cauldron. He has fairies causing mischief left and right. He has um, even, even soothsayers. So when it comes to something as foreign and powerful as the internet, never even imagine a website, how on earth could Shakespeare's characters identify with this? What would a website be like to someone into the 17th century? Not simply Shakespeare, but even the people in his audience. Very simply, we viewed that person as a god. Someone that's not even male or female, which is great in theater, because it could be played by absolutely anybody. If you're picturing Twitter as a person, it could be taking many different shapes and sizes. It could be a giant talking bird, almost like Papayeo from The Magic Flute, or Big Bird from Sesame Street. And ultimately, when it comes to McTweet and his introduction, he's someone or she is someone who is not partisan. They are simply here to report what's going on. And ultimately, it is worth mentioning that when it comes to the chorus, which um, Ian just read from, the chorus is actually all of you. The chorus is across social media. And ultimately, scene one, enter McTweet, writing on a scroll of parchment with a blue quill. McTweet. All politics is but a theater, and all the politicians merely actors. They read their lines and play their fleeting parts in pageants we the people judge by vote. It hath been dubbed a great experiment, but is in truth a motley entertainment. The perfect spectacle in which some knave may strut and fret his feathers upon the stage and may single-handedly may steal the show, even if those hands be orangish and small. <laughs> McTweet sticks his quill in his cap. Such is American democracy, the greatest government the world has ever known, at least is how these actors puff their chests, which I should know, for I am bound to parrot each peep and cheep its rabble tittle tattles. McTweet reads from several scraps of paper. One crow doth cry, democracy is humbug, a, silky, a, a shiny yarn of silken shadow that is puppeteered from spiders in darkened corners. While another bustard groans, the founders were all bad eggs, and their foul government as pining past and shagged as dodos damned. This buzzard pecks at young millennialarks with sniping hashtags, not with talon sharp. One night owl older than the dawn of time proclaimeth, politics is not for chicks, unless their kind be hooters, tits, or boobies. <laughs> Still others, an asylum of cuckoos, Dumb bird brains who rely on Fox reports whitewash our windows with their fascist facts. So sings the aviary's jarring choir of tweeting doves and hawks and eagles bald. If I ruffle thy feathers, be not peckish, for I am but a humble messenger, and tis a sin to kill a mockingbird. Yet such is a horse of a different feather. My song is ending now, and I must fly. A new day dawns, the birds again are chirping, and one enormous cock anon approacheth. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Gentlemen. <laughs> so now we're going to discuss. <laughs> well, since we're all so talkative, I guess uh, we should start with Andrew. Oh, what? <laughs> we're going to start with you guys. <laughs> well, I mean, ultimately, when it comes to the program and the discussion of today, it is on parody, which is work that we've all contributed to. And um, I guess when it comes to simply approaching parody, when it comes to looking at not only essentially the current administration and also the previous administration, but also parody as it's been in the United States, going back to before there was a United States, some of our first political cartoons. Uh, any discussion on, or any um, observations on how you personally chose to approach parody with your respective works? I, I liked that you had a lot of uh, wiener jokes and boob jokes in your yeah. thing. That was funny. That was how we approached it. We just thought, yeah. how many boob jokes can we put in? Well, it was, our, was like, our guiding principle. The truth is you can't <laughs> talk about US politics without there being a penis involved. I mean. <laughs> well, I will, say, I will say more seriously that, that when it came to 
for us, uh, I never wanted to walk a line into, into getting to the point where, we're, where it felt like we were being too mean or too cruel um, just for the sake of you know, bashing somebody over the head. Um, which at the same time, I did not at all want to paint a sympathetic portrait of McTrump, um, and certainly not of uh, his sons who, who we sort of transformed into uh, just sort of idiot lover types. Um, uh, but uh, but there were there were moments where where we were thinking about including something, and I was like, I think we should pull back from that a little bit because you know otherwise it just feels like we're we're just doing this um, to be mean, uh, mm -hmm. which is not really at least our yeah. Our I mean, with satire, there's always some criticism involved inherent in that. Um, so uh, a satire would be like, and it's a lot of times it's political. So uh, the film Wag the Dog. Um, what other satires have you? Any any political American thing. Dreams. That's a fun one. I like that. Um, Veep, one of my favorite television shows, um, is is definitely satire, and so it all has an element of criticism involved. It's either critiquing people or an institution. Now, with a parody, I think my books, um, at least Hope Rides Again and Hope Never Dies, are actually parodies where it's just humorous. But I'm not actually critiquing Obama and Biden in there. It's not going after them as politicians. It's just using that the politicians um, just using them so I can make money off of them. Um, <laughs> Uh, but but I think you know with my with my Trump book I was actually I was actually trying to make a, a serious you know a point that this guy's you know um, a buffoon when really that was actually plainly visible to most people that were receptive to that uh, uh, you know that that were watching what was going on so so my satire sort of fell not just because of the bad timing of it but also because it was you're like saying oh you're saying that guy's an idiot well you have to say something more than that, you know? And I think that's, you know, that's one thing about, you know, you can put out a book about Trump and you can just say, oh, this guy's an idiot or whatever, but but I think you guys in, in Mac Trump go a lot deeper than that, and, you, and especially with the other characters and everything. So you don't go for the easy joke. Well, I will say, though, there is some satire when it comes to addressing the fact that we have some people who seek high office who are literally older than sliced bread. Sliced bread came out in the 1920s. I remember growing up when Strom Thurmond was still alive and still a senator, like not necessarily in that order. I mean, I was like, where the hell did they dig this guy up? He was so crazy old. And, it's a, and that is something when you do address the fact, like, wow, there's a lot of old guys. It's, a, it's something that is funny, but that is actually a form of satire. It's something that I have no doubt that many people before us have addressed in their own approaches when it comes to writing. And uh, I, mean, I mean, the Egyptians literally had mummies as their chief executives. It can only last for so long before it all comes crumbling. I bet the mummies didn't tweet, though. Yeah. Don't be so sure. They had messengers. <laughs> and they had gods as well. McTweet is both. Top that. <laughs> so there. Uh, so, so you guys, like, like I did, also uh, deal in your book with real living people, mm -hmm. um, for the most part. You know, um, have have you had any response from them? Uh, not yet. Um, so, and hopefully never. Uh, <laughs> oh, come on, just one tweet from Trump. Well, that's true. We do actually hope for a Trump tweet at some point. Uh, calling yeah. you uh, sad. Yeah. What, what would your nickname be? Uh, Doucher. I oh, would, yes, Ian Doucher. Yeah, yeah. Take me right back to middle school. Yeah, oh, nice. You would no. probably think I'm communist. No. But uh, no, in all honesty, like, first of all, I don't even think you would know what to make of my name or my pen name. You'd probably think it was a misspelling, like, Kofivi. But um, no, no, no. In all, in all honesty, I, I, I mean this wholeheartedly. I honestly think the satire would go over his head, and he would just see a book where he's wearing a crown and think, yes, that's me. All of his followers should read that book. Democrats should stay away from this book. They're not smart enough to understand it. Yeah, they're all small-brained. I got a big brain, that's why I have such a big crown. <laughs> like, he would honestly be the, our best spokesperson. I'm gonna throw you a softball. Have you heard from anybody in your books? Um, I, I did, actually. Uh, I heard from, from Joe Biden. Oh, oh, I've, um, I've heard of him. 
Yeah, please. Have, have you heard from him? No, I've heard of him. Yeah. We have Joseph uh, Biden in our story. Okay, yeah, uh, I, I heard from Joe Biden uh, last, uh, was uh, last year when the midterms were going on, Joe came through Kentucky. His people got a hold of me and they said, hey, Joe's coming through there, he wants to talk to you. Uh, and I was like, oh, cool, that's awesome. And I was like, I didn't really know what. And so I, I brought uh, some copies of my book, assigned them for him. And he got up on stage, and that was the first time that we had seen really Joe do any, a lot of public stuff, at least politically. He had done, been on some book tours, which I'd seen him on, which were very fun. He got up there, and like I said, this was not Happy Joe. This was, I'm mad, Joe. This is, we need to do something, Joe. And he was fired up, and, he, and I was sitting like in the front row Row, just like, like, kind of shaking almost because he was just getting fired up. He even rolled his sleeves up, which is like, you know, like a Pete Buttigieg thing. But he was just like, oh, I'm, I'm getting serious. And I was like, oh no. And they're like, as soon as he gets done on stage, he's gonna come down and talk to you. And he was getting red in the face. <laughs> and he comes down afterwards, and he comes up to me and he goes, you, you wrote that book about me. And I was like, yeah, I'm holding it. And he goes, great job, I loved it, I loved it. I saw, oh, thanks, that means so much that you've read it, it just means so much to me. And he goes, I didn't read it. I love it, though. <laughs> um, you know, which is, which is not the worst uh, book review. Um, I, you know, we didn't go with that on the cover of the next book, though. I haven't read it, but I love it. <laughs> I mean, that's way better than the alternative, right? Which is, I read it and I didn't love it. Right, right. That's the one I'm used to. Right. right. You know, um, so this was this was pretty this was pretty exciting. And then he signed a copy for me, and I'm like, that's not how it's supposed to work. <laughs> You're supposed to go the other way. No, he he signed it for me. I actually saw him signing an Obama doll too, and I go, that is not you, sir. <laughs> and that was the first time I thought, wow, he is going to lean into this Obama thing really hard next year. And uh, you know, that's and he has so far, so. Yeah. I will say the closest brush I've come with politicians who read my writing, and I truly didn't know if they were happy or unhappy, is I was at a book signing in uh, Bucks County, Pennsylvania, Doylestown, if any of you have been there, very nice place. And uh, this one uh, gentleman who was actually at our book signing there a few days ago, uh, Mr. Griswold, he came up and he said, you wrote about my family. And I said, where? And they said, you wrote an article about shenanigans that went down in Congress. And you wrote about this one uh, Senator Griswold from Vermont who got into a physical fight on the floors of Congress in the, in the 18th century with uh, this one guy who kept on, Griswold kept on making fun of him, saying that uh, he had a wooden sword, which today would be like making fun of a cop for having a wooden gun. And the guy said, I'll have you know that I fought many prairie wars against you Vermonteers in many battles. And he said, oh, did you fight them with your wooden sword? And they had a fist fight, and Griswold won the fight. So I said, so what's your last name? And he goes, Griswold. I go, oh, you're from the family that won that fight. He goes, yeah, and we're damn proud of it, every single one of us. So that was a relief. Close as I can come, though. I kind of miss those days of American politics, actually. Uh, there was a, no, there, it was crazy, the stuff that they used to do back then. There was one fist, there was a fist fight right before the Civil War that happened in the House of Representatives that they literally had to break it up with the ceremonial mace that they have out there. And I kid you not, the fight didn't end until one of the congressmen picked up the other guy by his hair and it turned out he was wearing a wig, so he just pulled his wig <laughs> off. And they, and they all just laughed and they stopped fighting like it was a Saturday morning cartoon. And then two years, two years later was the Civil War. And then, <laughs> you know, over half a million people die. So. Yeah, I don't that. That was the that. punchline. Uh, <laughs> Horrifying. That's US politics. So Andrew, I, I, we have about five more minutes of discussion before we're gonna take questions, I hear. And so I wanna know about what was it, what did you decide to keep the same about your characters? Because you're writing fictional stories, obviously, about real people, and what did you change? Um, that's, a, that's a good question. I, I, I wanted to, the, 
have them be realistic, yet realistic to people's sort of interpretations of, you know, what Obama and Biden are. I didn't want the real Obama and Biden in my book. So this is what you imagine they are like in private life, but not what they really are like. Because I know that Biden privately swears up a storm. I know that uh, on occasion, Obama has, has dropped a few F-bombs. And, you know, and I wanted the books to be, this is like a, it, it's a contrast to uh, the way that politics are today, you know, just a couple of years later, you know. Neither of them are calling people shitheads or anything, you know what I mean? Um, so they're, uh, they're, it's, in the book, they are very much like what their public personas were. And so, and so because I, I read stuff about them uh, that, you know, that, that nobody would believe if I put it in the books. Like, did you know uh, that Joe Biden's, fa does anyone know what Joe Biden's favorite drink is? It's a sports drink. Gatorade. Orange Gatorade. That's just weird. Nobody would believe that if I put that in my book. They'd be like, this is just a weird detail or whatever. No. So there was some stuff I had to keep out of the books because it was so just, just so bizarre um, that I couldn't do that. And so, and so, yeah, so Orange Gatorade, it's just, it's just, I don't know anybody who's not like a junior high basketball <laughs> player that loves Orange Gatorade. <laughs> Yeah. It's just not. It's just not done. I heard the Teddy Roosevelt. They said he used to drink so much coffee that they said his coffee cup was the size of a bathtub, and they said his coffee was strong enough to float an iron wedge. Bully. Bully for him. <laughs> Hell yeah. That's why he died so young. I bet he was a pretty regular fellow, though. All right. So according to, according to his own daughter, he wanted to be the bride at every wedding and the corpse at every funeral. <laughs> That's Teddy Roosevelt that he couldn't walk past the White House without wanting to be in there, even after he was already in there. <laughs> he said he would read two books a day, if he had the time. <laughs> oh, well, wouldn't we all? Wouldn't we all? <laughs> so. uh, Ian, any, uh, Ian, any comments before Q&A? No, let's do Q&A. Right. Uh, yeah, is that all right? First off, let's give it up for our authors. <laughs> We're going to do a brief Q&A, so if you have a question, please raise your hand and I'll come around with the mic. We'll go here and then there. Cool. Thanks. Um, you really get Biden's voice so, it's so good throughout. I mean, you can really hear it. I'm just curious, I mean, as part of your writing process, did you like start every day by, you know, listening to a speech or reading a transcript or how did you kind of get into that voice? Uh, yeah, I, uh, what was my process? My process was I did, I listened to a lot of, um, a lot of his, his audio book is uh, just, he did one that he narrated himself. Um, I watched a lot of YouTube videos of him, and I just went down like this Joe Biden rabbit hole, which was which was how I just really tried to nail his voice. I did the same thing when I did the Trump book, and my wife was just was just like, when does Trump leave our house? I can't hear another Trump thing coming from your office. I can't, we've just got all these books laying around with uh, you know, the art of the deal, uh, whatever. And I, she was like, we need to get this guy out of our house. So it was, it was definitely a welcome change of pace. So a Shakespeare question. So Mac Trump obviously invokes Shakespeare, but for me it also invokes um, the big Mac. So, is there unintended parody that, as you guys were writing, that you kind of thought it just came out that you didn't intend originally? Um, well, that's the first time I've heard that that comparison. So, I guess that is an unintended one right there. Uh, uh, no, it yeah. wasn't. I did intend that. Well, great. Go ahead. Tell, say more about that. Oh no, no, no please continue. <laughs> Well, to answer your question, um, I'm sure there, well, the book just came out, so we would love to hear unintended uh, equivalents. If you remember, Ian, when we first did the cast of characters, we originally had the White House cook be named MacDonald at one point. Mm -hmm. But um, we do, um, you're the one who added uh, some of the McFeasting that they do in there. We do have one section where it's, we try to come up with a Shakespearean equivalent of a McDonald's buffet. I think we have, what is it, a McLam chop? I think it was, because we not only had to come up with food that would sound like something from Shakespeare's time, we had to also make it uh, appropriate for iambic pentameter. 
I, I think Mac right. Lamb Chop was one of them. Yeah, I mean, for me, the, the title is, um, when you hear the title of William Shakespeare's Star Wars, you get immediately what that book is. And I think that's true also when you hear the, the word McTrump, right? It just immediately makes you think, oh, this is Trump in some sort of Shakespearean sort of context. Uh, and we're not the first ones to, to have used it either. I, I mean, we, you, know, you can Google search McTrump and find things from, from before us that we didn't, weren't aware of before we started doing this uh, you know, that, that do that also. But uh, yeah, I'd forgotten about the fast food scene, but yeah. that absolutely is in there. Yeah, but, and, but not only that, you touch upon something very important when it does come to satire, which is how is our current president like a hamburger? <laughs> the truth is, he's probably like the worst type of hamburger, which is an unhealthy one, one that is clearly very quickly prepared, and one that we would do so much better with if we didn't have a second helping of. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Oh, yes. So you kind of... Uh, alluded to this already that people can find other things in it, but I think satire always is always trying to teach or educate people sneakily. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe this is going down the wrong rabbit hole, but is there a little bit in terms of the McTrump book, the idea of representation, Thomas Hobbes, any of that stuff, any philosophy of representation or politics involved there at all? Go, I'm in. I, um, without going into too many spoilers, as mentioned before, Shakespeare loved having some sort of divine characters in there. And Ian and I tried to imagine who are the divine beings in American history that, they would turn, that Shakespeare would turn to for inspiration. And for that, we looked at Uncle Sam. We looked at Yankee Doodle when it comes to McTweet. I actually picture him as dressed as Yankee Doodle, which is why he puts the feather in his cap. And we also have uh, two characters who are protesters, just commoners in the story, who Ian and I wrote as the personification of Lady Liberty and Lady Justice. And when it comes to their discussions, whereas we have the brothers having the stupidest conversations <laughs> possible, we have uh, these two protesters literally waxing back and forth letters from, um, you know, they're, they're literally waxing the Federalist Papers to each other. They're sharing works by Niccolo Machiavelli, by Plato, back and forth in this discussion in the middle of uh, the Women's Protest March. And they quote Emma Lazarus to each other. They're having this, uh, essentially, a philosophical discourse, which in terms of satire, we're shining a spotlight on it, which is what satire is supposed to do. And we're shining that, sp that spotlight while giving equal time to these brothers who are as, Ian, how would you discuss what the brothers talk about in comparison? Yeah, I mean, they're, they're just, they're idiots who are talking nonstop about women and how much they want to find love, right? Because in, in their book, they're unmarried people. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so there is this big dichotomy between those, those two sets of two characters. And also, when they're looking for love, how would you define their definition of love? Sex. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, and they want women who they can subjugate and, you know, and uh, I mean, they, they are hunters, right? Uh, as the real, uh, real Trump boys are, right? And so uh, they see uh, finding women as their conquest. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Um, yeah, so this isn't fully baked, so bear with me. Um, it's not long, though. Don't, 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 don't look at me worried. Um, but I worry that the left has lost humor. Um, I feel like, you know, you can't be counterculture and subversive when you are the culture. I mean, I, I think sometimes when you look back, I mean, like when you think of academia and journalism and all the mainstream institutions, the left has largely won. The left has lost the environment, lost the economy, but we were stuck with, you know, snide opinions and you know, getting to say what's morally correct for mainstream media or whatever. And I worry that, that, that that's in part because we've lost, like, I feel like when I go to campuses and I hear stand-up comedians, you're left with dad jokes and puns, and that's kind of it. And I just don't think that's going to cut it in terms of motivating people, persuading people, inspiring people, because I think humor is a powerful tool. So I'm just curious to know if you have any thoughts there. You commented on this earlier, before we came up here, about the intention of parody and satire. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I think that, I, I mean, I, 
you know, I think we have some of those concerns, uh, obviously, uh, as far as, I mean, what's, and it's a really hard question to answer that doesn't sound like like an old man get off my lawn, you know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> um, but um, yeah, yeah, I, 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 don't, yeah, I don't really have a, a way to answer that that doesn't sound like I'm one of those sort of jilted comedians. Um, but I do think to, to some degree though that you have to have a sense of humor makes, makes the medicine go down um, is, is how I would say. And, and it, it can't just be snide comments. It has to be, I think it has to be deeper than that, which is when I said that, that, that some satire is very, can be very mean to the point of it's not even satire at all. You know, it, it just becomes just a very mean thing, mean spirited. And I think you have to go deeper than that. But as an artist, um, it's not really something I can think about, you know, too closely. I just kind of do my art and then whatever happens, you know, whatever the reaction is, it, it you know, happens. Um, I'm not, I don't, I don't go to college campuses and, and you know, I'm not a, a comedian out there getting feedback on it. I, you know, I sit at home and I type up something and, and a year later it comes out. So, um, so the feedback process is a little bit different um, for us as far as, and, you know, but it, it's, it would be nice to think that as authors we have some sort of cultural cachet and can sway opinions or something. Um, and, and I just don't know, um, you know, how much, how much of that's left as far as with, with literature, but um, I, would, I would certainly hope there's, there's some there. Still. I mean, one thing I would mention when you were talking about the left winning so many times when it comes to reporting, when it comes to even authoring histories, I mean, if you look at, say, the memory of the Civil War, the left did not win how that was commemorized. That was a deliberate propaganda effort by the Confederacy in the sense that the most popular film in history adjusted for inflation is Gone with the Wind. Before that came out, the most popular film adjusted for inflation was Birth of a Nation. And furthermore, when we talk about the satire that's been, you know, that was out there during the American Revolution, those were all white guys writing it. When it came to the efforts by so many men and women during women's suffrage from its beginning in the 19th century, it was still two more generations before the 19th Amendment was, was passed. And then after the 19th Amendment was, was passed, it wasn't until the Civil Rights Act that we had black women in the South able to vote. So I'm not, I wouldn't disagree with what you're saying when it comes to the left winning. I would actually say that American history has shown that it is so fragile that essentially anybody, as we demonstrated with Matt Trump, can essentially capture the imagination of the public with dazzle and distraction. And thus, I view it as something that at any moment, the Civil War and everything it fought for could be lost. And everything that we fought for against fascism during World War II could be lost as well. That's a cherry thought. Yeah. <laughs> we, we never said satire is funny. I view Fox News as satire. I just think it takes itself seriously. <laughs> you know how horrifying the world would be if it was exactly as it's reported on Fox <laughs> News? It's a satire. It's a book. It is a horrible book that sells incredibly well. <laughs> I'm going to take a break. We have, time for, uh, we have time for one more question from the audience. Yes. Ian, I know your books have been used in schools previously. Um, so to all of you, if there was one thing that you want people to learn or discover from your most recent publications, what do you think that would be? <laughs> Well, I think Ian, your books specifically, the Star Wars stuff, you really reevaluated the the uh, first three movies of the Star Wars saga, right? The prequels. Would you think that people should take away a better understanding of the prequels as being high art? I mean, maybe. I, I never really <laughs> thought about that as as one of my. I just was trying to not make them what they were. Uh, <laughs> Uh, certainly, the educational part of of my previous books is like, other than like making people laugh and enjoy the book while they're reading it, is like the biggest thing for me. Um, it's hard for me to imagine McTrump being used in schools, but maybe it will be. Um, you know, uh, as an example of of political satire. Um, 
I, I doubt it's the kind of thing where people are where, where teachers are going to uh, teach kids Shakespeare uh, using this. Um, so I think that's a really good question, right? Uh, what what do I hope people would would learn from this? Um, and I don't know that I have a good answer. Yeah, y yet. So I would say when it comes to Mac Trump, at least um, we do um, we do mention at the end about uh, we have a final poem at the end about a teacher's guide, like this is something where we do hope that uh, students as well as teachers might be able to find some use for this in the classroom. I know the book is completely riddled with so many famous discourses, and even in some cases, some that might surprise uh, readers. We have Lady Justice is blind in our story. She's a blind woman, and when that solar eclipse happened during the Trump administration that Trump looks straight into, she's describing, as a blind woman, what it's like to experience a solar eclipse. And for that, I turned to a letter from um, Helen Keller, where she was describing what it's like to take an elevator to the very top of the uh, Empire State Building. Um, we deliberately put those things in there because this is the 21st century where anyone can find out an answer to a question with a search engine. We want them to explore and just use this book as the beginning of looking at other books, consulting the experts who have dedicated their entire lives to these fields. But ultimately, I really mean this. If there's one thing that I would want readers to take away from Mac Trump, it is that if you enjoy a book, write the author of the book. <laughs> Ian did that for myself. <laughs> And we ended up writing a book on our own before we had even met each other. We wrote the manuscript over the, over the course of five and a half weeks. That's all it took for us to write it. And I just think about all of the books that haven't been written yet, just because some people may be a little too shy or too timid to just say, hey, so-and-so, I enjoyed your poem. I enjoyed your book. I love that screenplay that you wrote. We have an easier time reaching out to each other than ever before. And just take advantage of that, and you will be very surprised to see the results. Don't tell people that it only took five and a half weeks to write a book because that makes the rest of us look bad if it takes me longer than that. Did I, I, we, we meant years, five and a half years. Yeah, I, didn't say, <laughs> I didn't say it was an easy five and a half weeks. I, I, I wrote my first book in a year, so my second book in a year and a half. And then I didn't write another book for five years. It was really waiting for the proper opportunity, the proper subject, and in this case, the proper co-author. All right, yeah, so um, so my book, the one thing that I want you to take away here from this series, and you can see it right here on the cover, actually, <laughs> I have, if we don't learn from the past, we're doomed to repeat it, I think. Hamilton said that. Um, <laughs> President Hamilton said that. <laughs> what I've got here in this book is Obama's tan suit. Yep. <laughs> Hashtag. Never forget the tan suit. 8-28-14 was the date. I want you all to remember that, the tan <laughs> suit. It was just, it, I, I, so, sorry, it's really hard to talk about the tan suit sometimes because it was so controversial at the time. And I feel that as the years went on, we kind of forgot, you know, kind of that nostalgia creep in. And, you know, the same way it did with George Bush. And we're like, we're like, oh, he's not as bad as, you know, uh, Mac Trump, you know, G George Bush the younger. And then we're like, yeah, but what about the Iraq war and all that kind of crap? And then we're like, oh, yeah, I forgot. You know, and then we go, oh, well, Obama's not, you know, it'd be better if we had Obama in the office, then I go, what about the tan suit? And they're like, oh, yeah, oh, crap, you're right. So, so just, yeah, just, just uh, never forget. Yeah. Can we give one more round of applause for our authors? Yeah.